Hello and welcome to my channel to this new video on graph embeddings. Now graph databases enjoy wide enthusiasm and adoption of analytics of integrated data potentially from various sources. However, in most machine learning algorithms they work on vector form data and therefore to unlock this powerful toolbox we need a way to map our graph structure to a vector form. And that's what I'm very excited about because I studied the Notovec algorithm and I'm excited about how straightforwardly and concise the approach is formulated and how well it works if you apply it to the right data. In this video, we will walk through all the important details. We are going to start with the basic motivation. Why should we care about mapping graph structures to vectors? Secondly, we are we talking about the problem. So how do we define this problem? What's the context of a node and um, what's the overall objective? And finally, we will walk through the math and here lies the key to the beauty and the simplicity of the approach, because once we understand the last bit of the equation, the novelty of the approach becomes obvious to us. So stay curious, it's going to be a pleasure and so rewarding to understand this. Get a coffee, lean back and let's do it. All right, part one, the motivation. Why should we care about graph embeddings? So we are trying to find a vector representation for our graph structure, and we are not talking about the directly associated features of each of the nodes, but rather we want to map the structure of the data, meaning the relationships between the data points to an embedding space so that we can feed this into a machine learning algorithm. There is a strong relationship to the word to back algorithm, which is a word embedding algorithm. So it maps words to an embedding space which share a similar context. However, if we look at a sentence, we can tell that it's a one dimensional array where each word has a fixed position and two direct neighbors, meaning the word after it and the word before it. However, if we look at a graph, it's represented as an adjacency matrix. So for each node in the graph, we get an entire vector of direct neighbors. So even though the approaches are similar, as the name suggests, we need a slightly different approach for mapping nodes to vectors. Let's go ahead and formulate the general objective of our optimization problem. We want to map nodes with a similar context, meaning they connect to the same nodes close in an embedding space where they are represented as vectors. Now, because you're following so attentive, two questions popped up in your head. First, what does similar context mean? And second, what does close in the embedding space mean? So you're going to be relieved as I tell you that we are going to be talking about exactly about these two questions. Let's have a look at the context of a node. So the context of a node is simply defined by nodes in the neighborhood of that node. There exist two orthogonal approaches how to explore the context of a node in a graph. And I'm pretty sure you're aware of both of them because they are tightly linked to breadth first and depth first search. The first similarity matrix is homophily. It's derived from a sociological concept stating that similar people tend to interact close with each other meaning that similar people have direct relationships. And you can already tell why it's related to a breadth first algorithm, because this algorithm first explores the direct context of a node before it goes more into depth. So the second metric is called structural equivalence, and it tries to detect the role of a node from a wider perspective. So a role of a node in a network would be, for example, so like in human networks would be, for example, an influencer or someone who connects communities or something like that. So we're not only looking at the direct relationships of a node, but rather we follow up on multiple relationships, potentially multiple hops to go into depth to see which other nodes our source node is connected to. This in the graph context is closely related to a depth first algorithm because there we also, we follow one relationship of our source node and then we follow up on this relationship to see, okay, whom else can we see if we follow this one relationship? And only if we have explored that one path into depth, we will move on to the next direct relationship of our source node. Now I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with depth first and breadth first search in a graph, but I will walk you through quickly here on a slide. All right, let's start with the depth first algorithm, which is the orange annotation here in the slide. So we start in source node one, and we would explore all its relationships into depth first be before we move on to the next direct relationship. So for example, we start with the relationship one, 
and we end up in node 2 and explore along the path until we cannot find any other node more into the depth. But here we would have to jump back to node 2. So we don't do that, but, but rather we go back in this path and see that in node 2 we have more relationships to explore. So we follow through on here. And from the 5 we don't jump back to the node 1, but rather we explore all the other relationships of 5. So we would continue with node 6 down here. And once we have explored this entire path here into depth, um, we would jump back to node 1 and then explore its other relationships. We wouldn't take the relationship to node 5 um, because we have already explored node 5, but rather we jump to node 3 and explore this relationship in turn into depth. Okay, the second approach is a breadth first algorithm. Here we all, uh, again start in node 1 and we explore all the direct relationships first. So we would um, jump to, to node 2, 5 and 3 in the first uh, three steps. And then we see we don't have any more direct relationships. So we explore nodes in the distance level of 2. So we jump to node 2 and, and go to all the direct relationships from there. So we would end up in nodes 9 and 8 and 7. And then we jump to 5 and go to node 6 and then to 3 and go to node 4. So here we have the context of node 1 using the depth first algorithm. And here we have the context of node 1 using the breadth first algorithm. Now having these contexts, we could already calculate how much these nodes contexts are overlapping. And therefore we would use the Jacquard similarity, which I have visualized down here. So here's the context of node U, which is the red circle. And then we have the context of node V, which is the orange circle. And in the intersection, there are uh, these four nodes. And in total, we have these four plus three, so seven in total. So we have four over seven would be our similarity of these two nodes. Okay, now we know what the context of a node means. However, we usually we cannot take into account the entire context of a node because that would eventually lead to capturing the entire graph. Therefore, we have to introduce a sampling strategy, which is basically a strategy to approximate the context of a node. In the node to vec algorithm, they introduce a sampling strategy, which basically is a fixed number of random walks starting in each of the nodes and exploring the context. Now, the context exploring is also parameterized, which is basically a trade-off be between the breadth-first and depth-first algorithm. So it's a trade-off between homophily and structural equivalence, because in each step of a random walk, the algorithm decides based on the parameter whether the algorithm should move one distance level away from the source node, which would be similar to structural equivalence, or whether it should stay close to the source node, which would be related to homophily or a more breadth-first algorithm. Now, with applying the sampling strategy at a source node in the graph, we can obtain the neighborhood of U given, given sampling strategy S, which is the context of a node which we are going to take into account and which, which will be denoted like this for the rest of the video and also in the paper. Now, having the context of each of the nodes, we want to find a vector representation such that nodes with a similar context are mapped close in the embedding space. Now the second question was what does close in the embedding space mean and that's answered pretty easily because it's the dot product between our two vectors which is basically the angle between the two. So the smaller the angle the more similar our vectors are. Now in that formulation we want to map nodes with a similar context close in the embedding space is the foundation of our optimization problem. And in the next step, we are going to formulate it from a mathematical perspective and explore how Notovex solves this optimization problem. It's getting interesting now. Okay, I wanna start with a single node in our graph, which would be node U. And that one we pick in our graph to be our source node for which we wanna find a graph embedding, for example. Now, if we explore the context of source node u in the graph, we can find e easily the neighborhood of source node u given the sampling strategy S. And that is the sampling strategy we talked about previously. So we have a parameter which decides how to explore the surrounding of the node u. 
and we end up with a set of nodes, these are the orange ones here, in the context of our neighbor, of our source node U. Now I want to define node V as being um, an element of the context of our node U. Okay, having these things at hand, we want to find a mapping function, which we call F, um, which basically maps a node to a vector of the dimensions. So F of U is a vector of the dimensions. All right, having this function F at hand, which are two vectors, we can easily calculate the similarity between two nodes because we just take the two nodes and generate the vector with the generating function f or the mapping function f and then we take the dot product as discussed previously which we can think of the similarity score in the embedding space. So we can think of the dot product as being the angle between the two vectors. So if node V is in the context of U, we want this similarity to be large. So the, the angle between the two vectors should be small. Now having the dot product as a similarity score in the embedding space, we want to transform that score into probabilities and that we can do by applying a softmax because the softmax basically normalizes our score into a probability because it squashes the numbers um, into an interval of 0 to 1 and all the numbers for node u, so all the combinations of v and u that we can potentially find in the graph have a sum that equals 1. So that's the softmax. If, you not f if you're not familiar with the softmax, um, please research that on your own. Now, having the probability, we can actually write this as a conditional probability. So we say the probability that given node u, which was our source node, what's the probability for seeing node v? And that we calculate over the function f, which makes a vector out of nodes, and then over the um, dot product, and we apply the softmax, and we arrive at that probability, which we want to optimize. Because as we know that node v is in the context of node u, we want this to be large, so we want to maximize this probability. And that's how the um, relationship is formed between context of nodes and similarities in the embedding space. However, having that at hand, we, on, we don't want to do that only for one node v in the context of u, but rather for the entire context of u. So we start from a source node u, and we want to find the probability for all the nodes in the context of u. So the probability for having this entire context given node u um, is in turn a conditional probability if we applied it to the entire context of u. And if we assumed independence of the nodes in the sample of the context of u, we can write this pretty easily as simply a product over all nodes in the context of u and we take the conditional probability which we saw earlier. So we take probability given node u seeing one of the nodes in the context of u and that's an entire product over all of these samples. And where we arrive is basically this up here. So we, we get the probability for seeing that all of the nodes in the context of u of the sample context given that we start in node u. Now this formula is still very easy and if we go ahead and apply this now to all nodes in the graph simultaneously, so we not only start from one node u but rather we start from all nodes in the graph a fixed number of um, random walks, so we sample each context of each node in the graph and then we apply this in our equation we would add up at the following equation, which is basically the final, uh, final equation for um, finding graph embeddings. So uh, here we have the probability for seeing um, the context, uh, the sample context of node u, given we start in one node u, which is basically this term up here, and then we, we sum these probabilities up over all nodes in our graph, so every node becomes the node u, and that's the entire score for our embedding we found. And we, of course, we want to maximize this equation. So we take this equation, which is the total probability score, which we want to maximize. So we want this to be maximized, which would be our best 
graph embedding we could find because nodes which would appear in the context of a node would have a close or a high probability in the embedding space and that's what we want to find. So we update the f function up here which um, we use to generate a vector out of a node and maximize for this probability using stochastic gradient descent. And that's basically it. It's, it's that simple. I really like um, how straightforwardly it is formulated and how um, easily it is understandable. And not to say that it's easily calculated because there are some challenges in calculating these terms. So there are some optimizations and approximations used to calculate this um, equation here efficiently on large data sets. Um, but you can look them up um, in the paper as well. But the basic idea is actually that simple. And that's, that's the amazing thing because that's all there is. It's very easily and intuitive formulated. It's a very concise description of the problem we are trying to solve and it's very simple math and still it works so well for many use cases. So if you like this video hit the like button, if you have questions leave them in the comments and make sure you subscribe for the next video where I'm going to be talking about, I don't know yet, but we will see. See you then, bye bye.